evening to you. I hope everybody is having a wonderful day. I am up now on Facebook Live. It was giving me some technical difficulties, so I do apologize. You all know how I like to be on time. And when I'm not on time, it gets on my nerves. <laughs> so, I hope everybody has been having a better day than I have. As usual, other people's children are kicking my butt. <laughs> Notice I said other people's children. But, we're going to take it one day at a time. Yep. One day at a time. Yep. Today just reinforced that parenting skills are sorely lacking. And there are lots of people in need of parenting skills. Just because you have a child, it does not make you a proper parent. I know somebody don't believe that. They think that just because you have a child that makes you a viable parent. It does not. You got to learn how to parent. And here's the other piece. You have to be willing to learn how to parent. You have to be willing to say, I don't know it all. Help me in coming up with some ways that I can help my child be successful all the way around. And then unfortunately, there are parents who were never parented, so they don't think that anything is wrong until, well, until they get a call from an administrator saying that uh, your child is uncontrollable your child is unruly. Your child is um, not willing to follow directions. Yeah, all of that good stuff. Ah, oh, well, it is what it is. Speaking of that, let's talk relationships tonight. We're still on our two favorite books for the moment. Vindicating the Vixens, and we're on Mary. And Everyday Narcissism. Yours, mine, and ours. We've been talking about a couple of topics. I don't think we're there yet. Oh, yeah, we're not there yet. I had to um, renew these books. But we've been talking about how rules help us and harm us. That's where we last stopped. That's where we last stopped. But man, the chapter that's coming, Lying to Survive. Woo! Some people have learned how to be really good liars. I'm telling you, this is a good book. <laughs> it's definitely going in my collection. Mm -hmm. Lying to Survive. And the next chapter after that is Victim Energy. And the next chapter after that is dealing with shame. Now you know this book is going to preach. So we're going to start with um, Everyday Narcissism. And we're going to be concluding, finishing up how rules help us and harm us. Right? We stopped here talking about um, the gentleman who was with the science teacher. If you recall, the science teacher was unbending in the example that was given. And so the student wound up taking the F or failing every time because they really could not see the benefit of following the directions if they were going to lose in either scenario or situation. So let's continue to talk about this uh, rules and how they can help us and harm or harm us. As more years pass, most of us become less and less conscious of our true selves. We move further and further away from listening to and caring for our own needs and wants. Most of the time, 
because somebody is pressuring you or demanding that you do something that you don't want to do. And then you wind up living a life of pleasing other people and never getting down to being who God intended for you to be. And when you are dealing with that, you either find people who get angry about the life they're living because it's not the life they planned for themselves or intended for themselves. They get bitter and resentful, especially if they see people out here living their best life and living the life they intended and planned for themselves while they are stuck doing whatever for whatever reason to please someone. Or unfortunately, you have people who get so depressed about the fact that they're not living the life that they know they intrinsically should be living that they just want to leave this world. And those are the people that unfortunately, when they do take themselves out, some of them write, some of them don't. But most people can recognize that there was either something going on with that person or they had recently lost something or they had feelings of not feeling like they were significant in the world or feeling as though nobody needed them or nobody cared. When I start hearing people begin to take on that kind of language, even in their social media posts, I start paying attention because what they're trying to tell you is I need somebody to know or I need somebody to feel what I'm feeling. I need somebody to reach out to me because I feel like I'm sinking and I don't know how to communicate that I'm sinking. I am lost. I am not feeling this world anymore. And so um, you'll start to see them write things that are sort of like fatalistic. When I say fatalistic, they might write something like, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter what we do because we're never going to succeed or we're never going to win or we're never going to overcome. That is what is called fatalistic thinking where there is no positive end in sight. And when you see people who seem to be stuck in that kind of language, especially on mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. media, you need to pay attention if they're your friends. You need to call them. If you have a number, you need to inbox them and say, hey, I noticed that your posts seem a little doom and gloom right now. What's, what's going on? Because that's not normal, all right? And as Prophet Jonathan said, they're exhibiting no hope. And a lot of people who end their life end it because they don't feel like there is hope for them they don't feel like there's hope for their situation. They don't feel like there's hope for tomorrow. So they just don't want to be in tomorrow. And if you've never felt like that, be glad. But some of us have felt like, listen, if I don't wake up tomorrow, it'll be perfectly fine. Nobody will miss me. I'll be good. I'll be with the Lord and I'll be okay. If that's not your testimony, Great for you. But there have been people, including myself, who have said, I just want to go to sleep and, and God, I'll be good if you choose not to wake me for the next day. Because what's going on right now, you can have it all. Okay? Not that I wanted to, not that I wanted to take myself out. But I would have been perfectly fine with God just saying she has run her race and finished her course and she could go on because it felt that terrible what I was experiencing. Okay, I know it's not a lot of honest preachers going on going around right now, but there are a lot of preachers that feel like that. Like what is going on? What is the point? Saints don't want to do right. <laughs> Saints don't want to follow directions. You're doing all you can to help and serve people. And they and you still feel like you're getting the short end of the stick. Or people could care less about your life 
but they just want you to give and give and give and give and give and give and give. And, give. and then nobody is wondering or asking how you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So pay attention to the language that the person is using. Instead of attending to our own wisdom, we allow our old wounds, the wounds of not being important or counted or likable, to be repeatedly re-injured. Tragically, by the time we are adults, we learn to deepen these wounds by calling ourselves stupid or lazy or hopeless or a loser, all in an attempt to get ourselves to shape up and not make a painful mistake again. For many of us, the resulting trauma becomes too much to endure. So we attempt to mask or avoid the pain through drug or alcohol abuse or harmful sexual behavior or perfectionism or workaholism, compulsive eating or other hurtful activities. All of these are a sign that something is wrong. All of these are a sign that rules are overwhelming you and you are not focusing on your relationship with your creator and with yourself. For many of us, this can be a pattern. So what are the benefits and drawbacks of rules? Around the age of five, most of us enter the larger world outside of home and daycare. This is the world of school, the neighborhood, a religious community or institution, organized sports, training in dance, music, or some other art. As our world begins to expand, we learn there are more and more rules to know and follow. This is where I am right now. <laughs> The challenge that I am facing is not so much that I am that I am unskilled or that I don't know what I'm doing. The challenge that I am facing right now is learning all of these 50, 1100 million thousand rules and procedures and not feeling like I have enough time to learn them because time is not being given to learn anything. It's just a whole bunch of stuff being thrown at me and it's like, learn this, memorize this, know this, here's this, here's this process, here's the procedure, here's this deadline, 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 deadline. Oh, and by the way, you have no time to complete it, any of it. So that's frustrating. Maybe you're not there, but I'm there right now. All right, so yeah, as our world expands, we learn there are more and more rules to know and follow. As we learn these rules, the chaos in our lives start to diminish. But before the, the chaos diminishes, it can seem like chaos because of how much information and how many processes you may have to learn first. And then you have to get acclimated. And then once you get acclimated, all of the chaos will begin to diminish. The problem is some people do not make it through the chaos. Some people don't make it through that time period. They get overwhelmed and then they say, I'm done. Five and six year olds love rules and love to tell others when they are not following rules. This is how children's socialization begins in earnest. For children at this age, habits and schedules and rules and other forms of structure help to make their world predictable. They also help children feel safe and secure. Children begin to know what to do and what not to do and can count on the rules to remove or reduce uncertainty and chaos. I am a person of routine. I like routine. I like routine. I create routines so that I can reduce uncertainty and chaos around me because I like to be at peace. So when I encounter people 
who have no rules <laughs> and who do stuff off the fly or who tell you things at the last minute and demand that they give you a deadline after they've told you past the deadline, it's annoying because I, I feel like I cannot reduce the uncertainty and chaos. Rules are also a sign of caring. The writer says, one of my clients told me that when he was in elementary school, his parents let him ride his bike in the evening as late as he wanted. His friends thought he was lucky because he could stay out late. However, he didn't feel lucky. He told me, I wish they had called me in for bedtime. It would have been a sign that they actually cared that I came home. Let me just sip this juice right there. <laughs> One thing I tell students, and I've told adults in some areas, but if your parents are giving you no rules, it's a sign they hate you. Now, I know somebody's going to say that's really harsh. But um, the Bible says, he who does not discipline their child hates them. And that word discipline is not talking about beating your child. It's talking about establishing boundaries and rules with your child. When you don't do it, you're actually telling your child that you hate them. Just let it sink in. Mm -hmm. Yep. Not all rules, however, or all forms of enforcement are helpful. When a rule becomes inflexible, or more important than the people it is meant to serve, rigidity sets in and people get wounded. When a rule doesn't serve the relevant people, it usually needs to be altered and not enforced with greater fervor. For example, the setting that I am in is a dress code setting for students. Thank God it's not a dress code setting for adults. I've been in one of those settings. I did not like it at all. All right. So this dress code is the student for per grade level has to wear a certain color shirt. And initially the rule was whatever, whatever covering they had. So they came with a shirt and a sweater or a shirt and a pullover sweater with a zipper or a jacket. It had the jacket or covering or whatever had to be the same color as the grade level shirt. That was the initial rule. Until our building got to be about 60 degrees inside and it was freezing. So what was happening, if a student came in and they had on the wrong color covering, they would make them take it off. Well, the students would be freezing and then they wouldn't be learning and then they would go home complaining. So that made that particular rule or how we were enforcing it irrelevant because if they weren't covered, they were cold, they were freezing and they were not learning. So what did my administrator do in all of her wonderful, lovely wisdom? She adjusted the rule. She made it relevant. So she said, we are gonna. We came back and looked at it. We're not going to fight with the students about what covering they have. They just, you just need to be able to see their shirt underneath. So if they come with a pullover, they need to zip it down enough so we can see what color the shirt is. That's it. If they came with a sweater, it didn't matter what color it was, et cetera, et cetera, and on and on. Why? Because the point was learning. <laughs> so if you are taking off a, a covering and you start freezing and you can't think about anything but the fact that you're cold, then the ultimate goal of learning is still not being met. 
So you don't want your rule to become irrelevant. So she was willing to adjust it rather than penalize children further because they didn't have matching colors. Which one is more important? The student in class, warm and learning or matching colors? I thought it was a good example. So <clears throat> they have another example here. Imagine you are hosting a slumber party for a ninth birthday. Your daughter, cousin, niece, nephew, etc. Their regular bedtime is 8.30 p.m. on most nights. However, enforcing it at a slumber party would disappoint their friends and the child that you're throwing the slumber party for. This would be a good night to make an exception and change the bedtime to 10 or 10.30 p.m., which would make the party feel special. Now, somebody is not going to like this next part, but it's okay because you'll live. When adults judge, shame, or reject their children for not following rules, even when the rules are helpful, they unwittingly promote the development of everyday narcissism. This is especially true when adults make it clear that following a rule is more important than caring for or being of service to human beings. Now, this is also where discernment kicks in because you are gonna have young people especially who test the boundaries of everything. <laughs> so on the one hand, you don't wanna be overly rule conscious but on the other hand, you don't want to be a complete pushover because then they will get the message that, oh, anytime I want to break a rule, all I have to do is go to this person and they're always going to drop the standard for me. Case in point, we have some lovely, lovely, wonderful children who every time they come to a class, they want to immediately go back out and do what they could have done on the way to the class. So they will use now, they're now using, especially the ladies, they're now using feminine hygiene as a way to say, I really need to get out of class. The problem with that is when they really do have an emergency, they're not going to be believed because they say it all the time. And most of us who are females know that it happens once a month, not every single day of the month. So you want to make sure that you, on one hand, you're not overly rule conscious, but on the other hand, you're not being a pushover or being uh, manipulated. Some rules simply don't serve anyone, yet we often adopt them without testing their accuracy, measuring their value, or considering their potential harm. Here are some of the rules that don't serve anyone. Many of these things began as sayings, but they have now entrenched themselves as traditions, especially amongst adults towards children. And some of these happen to be things that adults unfortunately say, they have now entrenched themselves that some of us just need to get it out of our vocabulary. Here's one. Children should be seen and not heard. I don't know how many people still say that, but unfortunately there are too many who still say that. If you're telling a child that they should be seen and not heard, you are shutting down their ability to come tell you when something is truly wrong. You might mean well, but what they're recording is I cannot talk to you at all because in front of you, I'm supposed to be mute. So if somebody's doing something to me or somebody's getting ready to do something to you, that child is not going to tell you because you have programmed them that children are to be seen and not heard. And so I can't say anything because they told me not to talk. And if I talk, I'm going to get in trouble. You are programming a disaster. That's what you're doing. 
when you keep saying that to a child. Here's another one. Keep your feelings to yourself. Well, that's what a lot of people who committed suicide actually did. They kept their feelings to themselves because somebody told them, your feelings don't matter. Your feelings aren't important. Nobody cares about what you think or feel. Just do X, Y, and Z. And so again, it's something that people say, but we need to think about what we're telling people. It is unhealthy to keep your feelings to yourself. Now, there are ways that you can express yourself. There are ways that you can get an emotional release that doesn't necessarily uh, put you in harm's way or put somebody else in harm's way. But to just tell somebody, keep your feelings to yourself is actually unhealthy. But yet people give this horrible advice all the time. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. Boys who cry or get scared I'm not going to say this word because I don't put this word in my vocabulary. But boys who cry or get scared are um, feminine. So you're you're training boys that they they should not uh, they should not use a natural part of the human body, which is to excrete tears. And there's a whole science behind that, which we won't get into. Boys who cry or get scared are feminine. No, boys who cry are human. And boys who get scared are human. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's okay for them to experience the range of their emotions. Here's another one. To be emotional is to be weak. This is often used against women. This is often used against women to say they shouldn't be in leadership because they're too emotional. If you are a man, especially going around saying that, just stop. Please and thanks. Because men are also emotional. Let their favorite football team win the Super Bowl and see how emotional men get. They be crying, throwing off their clothes, rolling around in the grass, painting their skin. Men are emotional. <laughs> All right. So to be emotional, again, is to be human. Humans have emotions. And it doesn't mean that you're weak. Here's another one. Real men don't cry. Jesus wept in the discussion. <laughs> Here's another one. Women who are assertive are the B word. I've had several students this week call me the B word or tell me why am I being a B? Mm -hmm. Now, I told my students, I only answer to my real name. So you can call me whatever you want, but I'm only going to answer to my real name. <laughs> so assertiveness is supposed to be a characteristic that most healthy people operate in. It means that you know what you want and you can communicate it and express it. Nothing wrong with that doesn't make you the B word. It just makes you very clear about what you want, what you know, who you are, and you expect a response. doesn't mean you're the B word. Here's another one. It's better to give than to receive. It's better to give than to receive. Now I'm going to, I would have to back up and say in what context. Mm -hmm. Because abusers actually use that against people who are givers naturally. Takers actually use that against people who are givers naturally. 
Sexual abusers have used that to coerce people into doing things they don't want to do with their body and their body parts. Again, these are things that are said, but we need to think about why we're saying them, who we're saying them to, and in what context. Here's another one. It's important to tell white lies so you don't hurt other people's feelings. I've heard that one often. It's okay to tell a lie to a person um, as long as your intentions are good or your intentions are not to hurt them. But you're hurting them because you're not telling them the truth. Now, there's a way, obviously, to tell people the truth. And so if you need training on how to speak the truth in love or you need, to, you need training on how to be graceful in your speech, then there are some public speaking classes out there that will help you with that. But just lying because you think it's not going to hurt the person is not good. It's not helpful. And here's another one. Taking time for yourself is selfish. Taking time for yourself is selfish. If you don't take time for yourself, yourself will plan the day for you to take the time. If you don't slow your own self down and recuperate and recover, yourself will shut down and you'll be forced to recover. I, I know for myself, there was one point where I was literally working myself down to the bone and I wound up getting carpal tunnel in both of my hands to the point where I had braces on both of my hands. Now as an artist and as a writer, that is just, uh-uh, mm-mm, never again. I had to wear braces on both of my hands for several weeks and I could not drive myself anywhere. I literally had to resign from a position because I could no longer even drive myself to go there. Don't be Shante. I had to learn the hard way. People will work you and 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 work you into disability. And then when you can no longer do what they need you to do, they will find a replacement for you in 24 hours. So please never believe that you are irreplaceable because I guarantee you, you are replaceable. And because you are replaceable, you need to take care of you. You need to be the best you that you can be, the healthiest you that you can be. Yes, Lady Dent, uh, balance. So I had to learn the hard way that people will appreciate your service and they will use you up and discard you and find somebody else. Exactly, to the left, to the left, right on out of there. It didn't matter how good I was, once I became useless to get the assignment done, they found somebody else, period. So don't let people fool you and have you out here just working yourself to death, talking about they don't know what they would do without you, they lying. Let me tell you what they would do without you. Replace you. Mm-hmm. If you went to be with the Lord tomorrow, in 24 hours, they would be finding your replacement. <laughs> you laughing. I learned the hard way. I'm trying to help somebody today. I learned the hard way. Honey, I thought I was irreplaceable. They replaced me in 24 hours. Yeah. As you learn more about everyday narcissism, you may find yourself evaluating your own parenting as well as the rules you use with children and the things that you teach to children. This process of self-evaluation can be beneficial 
and enlightening. However, it's important to remember that healing your own narcissist, narcissistic wounds and being a loving person go hand in hand. As you heal, you will automatically become a better and more compassionate mother or father or human being. My goal every single day is to become a more compassionate human being. Regardless of the things that I see happening with children, I have to keep in my mind, they're still children. They're still developing. They may be giving me their behinds to, 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 to kiss today. But I did it too. Yes, I did. I gave some adults my show enough behind to kiss. I rolled my eyes at adults. I thought I knew more than the adults around me because that is a part of child development. <laughs> at certain ages, children think they know more than you. It's a part of their child development. Let them think they know more than you all they want to. Just be ready to help them pick their face up off the ground, their lip up off the ground, help them with a band-aid once they crack their head a couple of times because many of them, especially our preteens and our teenagers, they are in the developmental state where they believe, they truly, truly believe they know more than adults. And once you understand that, that's half the battle. <laughs> So my famous, my, my, my wonderful phrase for children is you'll be back. Once you crack your head a couple of times and you realize that things are not going your way, you'll be back. You'll be back. You'll say, okay, I realize this isn't working. Can you help me? I sure can. I've been here the whole time. I am so glad that you decided to reach out and touch somebody's hand, right? But you have to let them go through the process of development. And unfortunately, what happens sometimes with parents, they become what they call the helicopter parent, right? And you're trying to make all the decisions for your children because you are trying to stop them from stubbing their toe. You're trying to stop them in many ways from doing or making mistakes because you recognize now as an adult that some mistakes you may not be able to fully recover from. That some mistakes can cost you your life. So as an adult, I have to, I have to recognize what mistakes do I need to allow the children around me to make that's not detrimental to their life. And what mistakes do I really need to focus on because that mistake could cost them their life. Right? So, I have to learn how to weigh those things. Obviously, if a child keeps running out in the middle of the street, they can get hit by a car. That's not something where the parent is supposed to be on the sidewalk saying, go ahead, just go on out there, run out in the street. No, <laughs> that's a mistake that can cost them their life, right? But if a child is doing something that is minor that you know, if they mess up in this, they might get the lesson through the mess up, then allow them to make the mistake. Again, that's discernment. Obviously, there's some things that you don't want a child to engage in because it could be life-threatening. So be compassionate with yourself as well. If you see that you are acting out of your own, oh boy. If you see you are acting out of your own unhealed childhood wounds, don't shame yourself or tell yourself that you've been a bad parent. Most of the time, parents are trying to discipline children out of their own unhealed places. How do we know? Because they start saying things like this. I know how I was when I was that age. No, ma'am, no, sir. Your child is not you. They may have your DNA, but they are still uniquely created by God with their own personality in their own divine plan. 
So if all of your discipline comes out of, I know how I was when I was that age. And when I was that age, I was into this. And when I was that age, I was doing this. And when I was that age, I was sneaking out. So my child's going to sneak out. So I'm going to make sure my child's not going to sneak out because I know how I was. I need you to, I need you to get it all the way together and go take a parenting class. Why? Because you're acting out of your own childhood issues. Mm -hmm. This will not benefit you or your children. Instead, use the knowledge to bring more compassion to yourself and to how hard you are trying to do a good job as a parent. Remind yourself that you may have been wounded and traumatized and you may not have recovered. You may be in recovery yourself. Be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with yourself. And I guarantee you'll start being more gentler with your children. None of us is a perfect adult or parent. Most of us, including therapists, routinely fall short of the ideal. As you heal your own wounds, your own parenting and grandparenting will improve no matter how young or old your children or grandchildren are. In turn, this will help your children's wounds begin to heal as well. People always wonder, why is it that the grandparents tend to let the grandchildren do whatever they want to do? Many times the grandparents recognize how many things they did wrong with their children and they want to correct it with their grandchildren. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if they didn't have to correct it with the grandchildren, but that if they started correcting it with their own children, going back and apologizing for some of the parenting styles that really weren't styles, they were survival. They were reactions to personal trauma. It wasn't parenting. And some people need to realize that. You were, you were um, dealing with your child out of your trauma. And you need to apologize. You do. It's not going to cost you anything but a little ego to go back and say, you know what? I was parenting you out of how my parents parented me. And it didn't help me, but I didn't know any other way to parent. So help me to be better. I want to apologize. I didn't always do the right thing, but I did try. And I now recognize the harm that some of the things I did to you and said I now recognize the harm that was there. Let's work on healing together. Let's work on getting better and being more compassionate with each other. Your children will appreciate it. Now it's time for you to examine and challenge the rules that you learn as a child. As you will discover, this is a profound act of healing and self-love. When you let yourself go back and look at the way you were parented and truly recognize your parent was probably parenting out of their trauma versus trying to parent you and, and figure out who you were as a little person. Because that's what children are. They're little people. They're not our property. They're not our property. They're God's property. But they're little people. They're, they're souls just like we are. They are fully human beings even if they're in a even if they're in a nice little tiny package all right so that's my conclusion for tonight for everyday narcissism next week we're going to talk about lying to survive oh boy being taught to lie in order to survive That can cover a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> Children who are made to lie for their parents. Tell them I ain't home. Bill collector calls. Tell them I ain't home. You made your child lie. 
What are you building on the inside of your child? So when you want your child to be truthful to you, but they've spent their childhood watching you lie, what is the result of that? What is the outcome? But we'll cover that on next week. Let's take a look at the Virgin Mary out of Vindicating the Vixen. We stop at Matthew's portrayal of Mary as a divine instrument. Luke is going to portray her as an exemplary disciple. So let's take a look at what Luke has to say, and then we're going to stop for the evening. Luke comes late to the gospel story, most likely having been the last of the New Testament writers to meet the Virgin Mary. Despite this, he has contributed the most to our knowledge and appreciation of her as a person. Paul's beloved physician, Luke, became privy to the details of interest to a doctor, the matter of conception, birth, and childhood. It would make sense that Luke the physician is writing from this perspective, as well as personal insights into Mary's state of mind. In this unique material, Luke develops the themes of promise and fulfillment that are central to Luke in Acts. Whereas Matthew is using Joseph as the key parental figure, Luke makes Mary the prominent parent in his telling. Luke consistently portrays Mary as deliberate and thoughtful, a determined and persistent woman possessing deep spirituality tempered with biblical understanding. The Annunciation. Luke introduces Mary to the reader with the Annunciation in Luke 1, 26 through 38. He notes her small town Galilee origins, excuse me, describes her betrothed status and strongly emphasizes her virginity. Luke offers no indication of Mary's age, but cultural custom suggests that she was in early to middle adolescence, past 13 years old, when she entered adulthood, but likely no older than 15 or 16 years old. A further clue may come from this detail. Following the Annunciation, Mary immediately travels south to visit Elizabeth, who lives in the unnamed town in Judah's hill country. The hill country lies south of Jerusalem, some 80 to 110 miles from Nazareth. Assuming Mary followed Jewish practice, she would have avoided traveling through Samaria, a detour which would have added more miles. Even if Mary had a male escort for such a long journey, one would expect that Mary was a little older than the minimum age of 13 years to make such a trip. So her age is likely somewhere from mid to late teenage years, somewhere between 15 and 16 years old because she is traveling alone. Despite her youth, the angel greeted her as highly favored. This term describes her as the recipient of a special grace, namely the privilege of serving as the mother of the Messiah rather than one in possession of a prerequisite quality of grace. At the same time, the angel states that Mary has found favor with God. This idiom is used in the Old Testament to describe a positive disposition towards someone, often based in that individual's prior performance or quality of character. In this case, the latter would be preferred since Mary's qualities quickly become evident as she responds to these experiences. She ponders the significance of the idiom. She is thoughtful and deliberate, a young woman whose resolve is not easily shaken. Now Mary and the angel engage in a dialogue. In the first part, Mary receives the news of her coming pregnancy and birth. Her response, a simple question, contrasts sharply with Zechariah's question from Elizabeth's husband, that he posed to the angel. 
Zacharias' use of no displays his incredulity at the announcement, despite its holy context and supernatural visitor. Mary uses the same word no to indicate the absence of any sexual intimacy that would facilitate conception. Yet she does so in a way that confirms Luke's early assertion of her virginity. Mary demonstrates that she believes the angel's announcement, but she is curious about how this conception is supposed to happen, seeing as she has not been with a man. This is not her doubting God. This is her doubting the fact that her body has never been utilized sexually at this point. In the second movement, the angel answers Mary's question and provides her with a sign. The angel explains that her conception will be a supernatural event intended by God himself. Then the angel offers her a confirming sign. Biblically, a sign was not to persuade the skeptic, but to confirm God's promise and to reinforce the faith of those whom the promise was made to. Those who received the sign were expected to check it out as an aid in their obedience, not in proving that God was going to do what he said. Since Mary has already expressed her acceptance of the announcement, the angel gives her a sign. Elizabeth is pregnant despite her being long past childbearing age and previously unable to conceive. Mary responds with remarkable self-identification. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Her use of servant recalls the Old Testament servant Isaiah who submitted to God's will and represented his purpose. Despite human misunderstanding, the servant looked to God for the vindication of his identity and message. He was a living testament to God's faithfulness. Mary affirms her identity as the servant with a second statement. May it be according to me, may it be to me, excuse me, according to your word. Taken together, these two reveal a very intelligent and biblically cultured young woman with a deep confidence in God who is commissioning her. Mary knew who she was and Mary accepted the call. The visit to Elizabeth is what we will cover on next week. So this is not just some scared young girl. This is someone who has a relationship with God. She is confident within herself and she is ready to take on the call. How do we know? We don't see any scriptures talking about and Mary through hands because people started saying, whose child is it really? Some of y'all know that had God assigned you the task of bringing forth and conceiving and the neighborhood started talking about you and whose daddy your child really was, some of you would probably have popped off. Mm -hmm. Yep. But Mary doesn't do that. She shows her maturity. This has been another episode of Daring Dialogues, and I've been your host tonight, Shante Charles. I hope that I've said something to get you thinking, something to get you reading and studying, and something to encourage you as an adult working and living and birthing children. If you would like to join us for the response conversation, you can join us at the link on Periscope. I will leave it down here in the comments section. Until next time, Facebook, we'll see you tomorrow. We'll be talking uh, pagan Christianity and letters to the church. Take care and God bless.